Good morning. Wow, there are faces to look at this morning. Uh, welcome to you, and welcome to you who are visiting with us uh, on this in this morning. Um, if this is your first time to visit with us, and I understand we do have some people who are visiting for the first time, we especially welcome you, and I welcome you on behalf of the whole church. And welcome to you who are worshiping with us online. And we, of course, will be continuing that in this time uh, of uh, having a kind of hybrid, which we will always have, uh, but we will certainly have that during this time. I want to uh, tell you a few things about worship this morning. Uh, we have two hymns. If you're worshiping at home, you can find the uh, words to the hymn on the web page where the live stream is. Um, and uh, for those of you here in the sanctuary, uh, as you know, uh, we can't sing, but you can hum. And you are welcome to do that uh, as um, our choir leads us in singing. Uh, we, of course, our singers are in masks. Uh, the clergy and all the participants, uh, we're sitting out front uh, during this time, and we're wearing masks unless we are speaking up front. And, uh, and of course, we're maintaining uh, distance and following all the protocols. It's that that enables us to uh, worship together in this way. Uh, strict adherence to the protocols, pre-registration, and all the things that we are doing. And uh, so thank you for uh, paying attention to that and, and following those things carefully. So as we bring in the light of Christ into our service symbolically, uh, we invite you at home to set your worship space and light a candle along with us uh, to also bring uh, the light of Christ symbolically into your home. And now, friends, I invite you to prepare your hearts and minds for worship.
Would you please stand for the call to worship? Which is both wonderful and easy this morning because my line has nine words and our response together has eight words. The response together is going to be, let us rejoice and be glad in it. So here we go. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. invite you to remain standing and if you are online with us if you don't have the words or our affirmation of faith I ask you to just say it from your heart as much as you know I know some of us might have a piece of paper and uh, let's just say it of uh, our faith together we are not alone we live in God's world we believe in God who is created and is creating who has come in Jesus the word made flesh to reconcile and make new, who works in us and others by the Spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to love and to serve others, to seek justice and resist evil. We proclaim Jesus, crucified and risen, our judge and our hope, in life, in death, and life beyond death. God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. Amen. Please be seated. As you know, one of the most important and really one of the most fun things that we do is participate in the sacrament of baptism. And so this morning we are honored to welcome the Allen family to come forward with Jackson Benjamin for this sacrament.
sisters and brothers in Christ, baptism is a sign of God's mercy and love, reminding us that we do not come into relationship with God on the basis of what we do, but rather on the basis of God's love and acceptance of us. Children have always had an important place among the kingdom of God. Remember the words of Jesus, how he said, let the little children come to me. Do not hinder them, for it is such as these belong the kingdom of God. And now I ask you, as you stand before God in this congregation, do you affirm your faith in Christ? And do you promise to serve him as your Lord in union with the church, which Christ has opened to people of all ages, all nations, and all races? And will you nurture Jackson Benjamin in Christ's holy church, that by your teaching and example he may be guided to accept God's grace for himself, to profess his faith openly and to lead a Christian life? Okay. Jackson Benjamin, I baptize you in the name of the Father of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now if you'll place your hands on him also. There you go, yeah. There you go, good job. Jackson Benjamin, the Holy Spirit work within you, that being born of water and the Spirit, you will remain a faithful disciple of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, friends, we have an opportunity and a responsibility to respond as the congregation. And you should have uh, on your uh, slip of paper in the pew, I believe, a response. And so I invite you to join in that response now. With God's help, we will so order our lives after the example of Christ that Jackson Benjamin surrounded by steadfast love, may be established in the faith and confirmed and strengthened in the way that leads to life eternal. Amen. Good morning, friends. Yes, standing for the gospel, that's old school, isn't it? Well, good morning to my friends here in the sanctuary, and good morning to friends at home. We are together by technology, and more importantly, we are together in spirit. And together, we are going to explore a story from the Bible that you heard a few minutes ago, but we're going to explore it in a slightly different way. Now, before we open up this Bible, we have to do the song. This is the Bible, the book of God's love. But as Dr. B had maybe mentioned earlier, those of us here in the sanctuary can't sing right now because sanctuary means safe place. And it's our responsibility to keep it a safe place. But you at home, finish that bite of waffle 
and swallow because you're the ones who are going to sing and the rest of us are going to be keeping a steady beat. We're going to clap as friends at home sing, this is the Bible, the book of God's love. And then when we get to the ah part, instead of singing ah, you're just going to throw your hands way up in the air. Okay, you ready? Here we go. This is the Bible. This is the Bible, the book of God's love. This is the Bible, the book of God's love, written by people inspired from above. Ooh, this is the Bible, the book of God's love. See, together we can do really cool things. So today's Bible story, you heard a version of it a few minutes ago, but I wanted to point out that this story has so many different feelings in it. And God gave us our feelings all of our feelings and there are times when we need to feel them all so here's what i need for you to do i'm going to read the story listen very carefully whenever you hear me say a different emotion or a different feeling i want you to make the face of that feeling and hold it until you hear the next one so if i say sad so friends at home it's really funny to ask for a face to be made and everyone i'm looking at in person is wearing a mask but you know, it's interesting, during this COVID time, it's almost like we're getting pretty good at reading eyes, aren't we? So kids, I don't ever want to play you at Go Fish again, because you will know exactly what my cards are. All right, with that in mind, get ready, listen carefully. Here we go. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was excited and asked, who is this? The crowds answered joyfully, this is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. Jesus entered the temple courts and was angry at what he saw. He drove out all who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves. All there were very surprised, including probably the doves. It is written, he said to them sternly, I've got a really good stern face. I've got that crinkle right there. My house will be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. Those who could not see and those who struggled to walk were filled with hope as they came to Jesus at the temple and with kindness, he healed them. Oh, we all have very kind faces. And when the chief priests and the teachers of the law saw the wonderful things he did, and the children joyfully shouting in the temple courts, Hosanna to the son of David. They were very irritated. Do you hear what these children are saying? They asked him. Yes, he, Jesus replied calmly. Have you never read from the lips of children and infants? You, Lord, have called forth your praise. And they were filled with wonder. As Jesus left them and went out to the city of Bethany to spend the night. You know, all of those feelings are so important, even anger. And I think sometimes we think, oh, we're not supposed to be angry. We're supposed to be in, right, out, right, up, right, down, right, happy all the time. But sometimes we, not only do we get to be angry, but we're supposed to be angry. Even Jesus from time to time would be angry. But it's important to notice that just because Jesus gets angry in the Bible doesn't excuse us to be angry any old time about any old thing. But notice, what is it that Jesus is angry about? He's angry about people being treated unfairly. That notice when it's important to read our Bible and to read the stories of Jesus so we know not only that we get to feel our feelings, but when to feel them. Read the Bible and notice when is Jesus feeling grateful and why? When is Jesus feeling sad and crying? When is Jesus feeling grateful or joyful and even angry? It's okay to feel anger, but if we follow Jesus' model, we'll know when and why that feeling is appropriate. And I want us to close with something. This is from Proverbs, from the Old Testament. This is 16, verse 32. The one who is slow to anger is better than the mighty. And notice, it doesn't say the one who never gets angry, but the one who is slow to anger is better than the mighty. Right when we feel like we're going to get angry, like someone has said something, or we've seen something that someone has done, and we want to get really, really angry, be slow about it. Maybe anger is the appropriate feeling. But let's remember, 
would Jesus be angry at this? Hmm, let's follow that model. So here's what we're going to do as our closing. We're going to do it together. So I want you to warm up your lap drums. This is something you can do here in the congregation and for our congregation on couches at home. And we're going to go like this. The one who is slow to anger is better than the mighty. And we'll do it nice and loud. Ready? Here we go. The one who is slow to anger is better than the mighty. Taking a breath. <sighs> Let's do it softer and slower. The one who is slow to anger is better than the mighty. Taking a breath. Ah, softer and slower. The one slow to anger is better than the mighty. Deep breath. Ah, loving God, thank you for all of our feelings. And thank you for your son, Jesus, who shows us and who models when to feel what. Amen. Mr. Mark, thank you so much about reminding us of our feelings. It reminded me that my main feeling often, would you like to know what it is? Yes. Confusion. It's a lovely feeling. Hey, welcome to everyone, to those of you here in the sanctuary, uh, to those of you worshiping at home. Welcome, live streamers, YouTube, Facebook Live. We're so glad you're here. Uh, Mr. Mark is now, he's getting back on Facebook Live. He'd love to chat with you. We're so glad that everybody is here today. Uh, I especially want to thank all of you worshiping here in, in the sanctuary this morning. Thank you for your attention to detail. You know, thank you for, for uh, wearing your masks. Thank you for, uh, it was really neat to watch all of you come in with the different ushers and guides this morning. And I think it was just a great uh, affirmation of teamwork. Uh, thank you for acknowledging others without, you know, breaking our space rules. Because in the end, we simply want to care for one another and we want to try to do our best to make certain that everyone is healthy. If you haven't seen it yet, I encourage you to watch the video that was sent out this week uh, by our communications team. It went uh, in an email uh, in the middle of the week, and it's also on our website right now. The star of the video is Richard McQuiller. Richard is a member of our communications team. Uh, I used to do Moment with Mike, with Richard and others on the team. Uh, a year ago, Richard and I did a video together, and I tried to overact the whole time to be funny, and I never was. And Richard just naturally brings the funny. And he's not only funny, but he demonstrates the right way for us to uh, come to the church and be ready to worship and to respect others. And uh, so I thank you for that, you know, coming today and also as you leave at the end of the service. We also are so grateful for everyone's support of the church by your offering. It's been for seven months now, all of you have gone above and beyond. Uh, and even though we're not passing offering plates this morning, we are grateful for the many, many different ways that you give and the many ways that all of you in our virtual congregation give as well. We're so grateful for that. Um, during the last seven months, I've gained this appreciation as for the music in the offertory being a celebration of God's gracious love and our opportunities for generosity. So we give thanks for the Choral Union section leaders and this celebration of giving.
Thank you, friends, for that beautiful piece. Well, what a blessing it is to be together, either virtually or uh, now in person in worship. I'm continuing a series of sermons on uh, about Jesus. Jesus, the good troublemaker. Jesus was all the time getting into trouble, causing trouble. It was good trouble, to use the late John Lewis's words. Jesus made people angry. Uh, sometimes it was the Sadducees, sometimes the Pharisees, or the Zealots, or the Herodians, or the Roman authorities. All the time making people angry because perhaps he, he included a wide range of people that others thought maybe he shouldn't have included. We saw that a couple of weeks ago when Jesus preached his first sermon in the synagogue at, at Nazareth. Or perhaps it's because he was hanging out with the wrong people. Uh, he was having table fellowship with the sinners and the tax collectors. The sinners were those people that, for whatever reason, were unable to keep the law completely in all of its details. So they were labeled sinners. And the tax collectors, of course, were seen as traitors who had sold out to Rome. And so Jesus is eating and drinking with tax collectors and sinners. It's a phrase we see over and over again in the Gospels. And it got him into trouble. Well, in our passage for today, we have the story of Jesus cleansing the temple, as it's traditionally called. Jesus went to the temple. It was the last week of Jesus' earthly ministry, the last week of his life. Jesus went to the temple. Now, we ought to understand what that means just a little bit. Uh, going to the temple is not the same as coming into a church building. The temple had levels, uh, had areas where you could or could not go, depending on who you were. Uh, so Jesus went into the court of the Gentiles. That's the outer court. Anybody could go in the court of the Gentiles. And the next level would be uh, the uh, court of women. And so everyone who was a Jew could go into that court, men and women. And then the next level would be called generally the court of the Israelites. And, and uh, Jewish men could go into that level. And then the next level was the court of the priest, the priestly court, and only the priest could go uh, in there. And then at the back of the priestly court was the Holy of Holies, and only the high priest could go in there. That was understood to be where God lived, where God was especially present. <clears throat> and the high priest could go in there, but only once a year. So there are these levels. Jesus was in the court of the Gentiles. And in the court of the Gentiles, there was some commerce that took place. See, everyone had to pay a temple tax. And it was paid at Passover. This is the week of Passover. And the temple tax could be paid in most uh, villages and, and uh, towns. About a month before Passover, there were booths that were set up for that purpose. And people could pay the tax there. But if they didn't get the tax paid early enough, then they had to go to the temple to pay the tax. And the tax had to be paid, wherever it was paid, in a certain currency. And if they had a different currency, which most people did, and they had a lot of different currencies as they came from all over, that had to be exchanged into the proper currency. If you've traveled internationally, you know what that's like to exchange uh, American dollars into whatever currency where you are traveling. And you know that there's a cost to that. There's a fee that's paid for that. Well, that was the case here. The money changers who were exchanging the money charged a fee. But here it is, Passover week. And people who are coming and changing their money in the temple now uh, don't have any options. And so the money changers are perhaps doubling their fee, or tripling their fee. They're charging whatever the market will bear, and it would bear a lot. And so they're taking advantage of people. 
people who are going to pay the temple tax and maybe they haven't been able to pay it elsewhere and they finally have gotten the money together to go and pay it and then they're taken advantage of in that way. It was unjust. And then there are also the people selling doves in the court of the Gentiles and, and people who went to make an offering in the temple. If they were poor particularly, the only offering they could afford was the offering of a dove. You may recall that Mary and Joseph go to the temple for purification. And what can they afford? A couple of doves to make their offering because they were poor people. But you could buy your doves anywhere, right? But there was someone who inspected the doves to make sure that they were without blemish as the law requires. So it was common practice we read in history that uh, the people who would inspect the doves would often uh, be getting a cut on the side from those who were selling them in the court of the Gentiles. And so for some reason, all those doves that were bought elsewhere just had some blemishes, you know. And so they were forced to buy the doves in the court of the Gentiles and they were taken advantage of. The price might be double what it was outside. And this practice had gone on for a long time. It was just the way things were done, right? It's just, just how it is. But not for Jesus. Jesus, who is actually referred to as a prophet in this passage of Scripture we heard, does something prophetic. And it's not the first time he has done that in this week. You remember, he enters Jerusalem. It's Palm Sunday, the Sunday we call Palm Sunday. He enters Jerusalem and he does it in such a way where he in the best of the prophetic tradition is making a statement see there were many people who saw Jesus as the Messiah but they understood his Messiahship to mean that he would get together a revolutionary army who would overthrow the Romans and kick them out of the land and that's not what Jesus Messiahship was about at all that he would set up a new kingdom of Israel. But Jesus talked about the kingdom of God. And so when he entered Jerusalem, he entered Jerusalem very carefully orchestrated way. He entered on a donkey, not a great white stallion, as a conquering hero, but lowly and seated on a donkey. And those words are from Zechariah. He was intentionally staging a demonstration of his messiahship and his understanding of the kingdom of God in the way he entered. Well, that's very much what he did in the temple. He was angry. I, I remember um, as a child the little Bible that I received as a third grader. And uh, in our little church, uh, it was expected that you get your Bible in the third grade, but somebody would buy it for you and give it to you. My grandmother gave me my Bible. And it was a Bible that had a lot of pictures in it. And I remember very well uh, because it made an impression on me. In fact, I remember, I can only think of two pictures of Jesus that I remember vividly. One is Jesus welcoming the little children. And the other one is Jesus cleansing the temple. And the picture was the depiction of the Gospel of John's version of the cleansing of the temple. In John's version, Jesus makes a whip out of cords and whips the money changers in the temple and those who are selling the doves for sacrifice and turns over the tables and opens the cages and all that. And this picture is very graphic. And the look on Jesus' face is one thing that I remember uh, from my childhood. And, 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 and he's holding a whip. It really made an impression on me. Coins flying everywhere, the tables going every which way, people running and scattering, and birds flying all over the place. But Jesus was making a statement, and it was a statement about economic justice. Because the practices of the temple were unjust, and they made life even more difficult uh, for the poorest of the poor. 
Do you remember the story of Jesus and his disciples standing by, uh, watching people make their gifts in the temple treasury? And, and uh, some are coming with great fanfare, making large gifts and making a big deal of, out of it. And, and a poor widow comes through. And by the way, to say poor widow is really repetitive because widows and orphans, people, uh, women and children who did not have a man in their life uh, to care for them or to own the property or, or to take care of things were really the poorest of the poor. And she comes, this widow, and she places her offering in, and it's two copper coins. Now, traditionally, we have often thought of that as, wow, she's giving sacrificially. I, I tell you what, I've preached the passage that way a lot through my ministry. But look at it more carefully. And what does Jesus say in relation to that event? He says, this poor widow has given all she had. And then he says, of the temple authorities, that they devour the houses of widows. You see? In that place and in other places, Jesus is very critical of what goes on there and sees it symptomatic of the larger issue of economic justice for the poorest of the poor. You remember when Jesus preaches that first sermon in Nazareth, what does he say? He reads the words of Isaiah, which lays out his mission. And his mission is uh, to proclaim, to preach good news to the poor, uh, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to set the captives free, to... Re uh, for the recovering of sight for the blind and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Do you hear how much of that has to do with dealing with oppression and setting people free from whatever it is that binds them? And the year of the Lord's favor is understood to be the year of jubilee. In Hebrew scriptures, in the law, there is a year of jubilee. It's, it's seven Sabbath cycles. Because not only are the days in sevens, but so are the years. And there's a Sabbath year where the crops, where the fields lie fallow, they rest. But there are seven cycles of seven. So in year 50, there's this year of Jubilee. All the debts are to be forgiven. All the land restored to the initial owners, even if it's been taken in payment of a debt. Now, as far as we know, the year of Jubilee was never really observed. And you can imagine why. But what a, what a great concept. And it came to mean by Jesus' day, this starting over, this new beginning, this fresh start. And he proclaims the year of the Lord's favor, the year of Jubilee, in that sermon in Nazareth. Well, all through Jesus' ministry, in fact, before before his ministry, when you, when you look at his birth, you can see this consistent care for the poor. You can see that Jesus is born not in a royal household, but he's born to Mary and Joseph. They're peasants from the podunk town of Nazareth. And the only reason they're in Bethlehem for the birth is because they have to be there. They're compelled by the Roman authorities to go to Bethlehem because that is the house of David. Uh, that's, and, and Joseph is of that lineage, and so he has to take his family there, even though Mary is very close to giving birth. And they're there for the census because that's how taxes are exacted. And the Roman system of taxation was really, really burdensome and corrupt. And so they, they're in Bethlehem. Jesus is born... And in a stable, and his bed is, is a feeding trough. And the consistent message is that Jesus and his family are poor. And God comes into the world to identify with all people, especially those who are oppressed in whatever way they're oppressed. You remember that... The wise men come looking for someone, a king who is born, and they, 
They go to Herod to find out about this king. And of course, when Herod finds out about it, he's threatened. And he tries to kill Jesus. And the family flees to Egypt. Jesus' family was a refugee family. And then as Jesus grows up and begins to teach over and over again, he talks about ministry to the poor and caring for the poor. And over and over again, he challenges the Roman system or the temple tax system, whatever it is that is oppressing people. So we talk about economic justice and do you know that phrase, you probably do know this, that phrase economic justice or social justice has come to be a, a, a difficult phrase for people to hear. It's come to be a, a, a divisive phrase, a controversial phrase. Which is odd considering that we say in the Pledge, and, Pledge of Allegiance, liberty and justice for all. I mean, that's who we stand for as Americans. And, and through the decades no matter political persuasion, uh, people have come together to figure out how to make life better for everybody. How, how to raise the standard of living for everybody. How to practice economic justice. Now what everyone throughout the ages has disagreed on is how to do that. But they've been able to figure out ways to compromise and come to that. I think economic justice is an uncomfortable topic, too, because uh, just to think about it means I might have to make some changes in my life and maybe some attitudes that I have or some opinions I have are not what they should be. But Jesus consistently pointed to this thing he called the kingdom of God, where God's will is done on earth as it is in heaven, as we say in the Lord's Prayer every Sunday. Consistently calling people to live in a way that follows the will of God, and surely that includes making life better for our brothers and sisters in every way that we can. And that's what Jesus was certainly about. It's one of the things that certainly got him into trouble. It's an old saying, but it bears repeat, repeating that Jesus comforted the afflicted and afflicted the comfortable. And it got him into trouble. You can imagine that some of the people who were money changers or selling doves in the temple would be the same people who would be demanding his execution at the end of that week in Jerusalem. John Wesley, who is the founder of, was the founder of the Methodist movement in 18th century England, said that he expected all Methodists to... Uh, to practice personal holiness and social holiness. That was the language he used. And in fact, he said there is no holiness without social holiness. And so the early Methodists, seeking to follow Jesus in this way, were opposed to slavery. John Wesley fought constantly for the abolition of slavery. And you can imagine the trouble that got him in with the merchants uh, the captains of the ships and the merchants who benefited from the institution of slavery. Only the wealthy could afford a, a real education in 18th century England. But the Methodists and other groups like the Methodists started Sunday schools. They met on Sunday because that was a day when they could meet and they didn't just study scriptures as we do in Sunday school today for an hour. But Sunday schools were schools to teach people how to read so they could better themselves, so they could, uh, they could make a better living, so they could participate in life more fully. And that was social justice. That was economic justice. Education for all ultimately was the result of that. It's something that we value as United Methodists, public education that's of high quality for all people. It is a social justice and an economic justice issue for us. Well, I wonder as I think about 
what issues we have today that we should address, what we should care about as followers of Jesus in this regard. And it just makes me wonder, what would Jesus cleanse? If Jesus came into my life or your life or into our world, what would Jesus cleanse as he cleansed the temple? What would, what would he do? What would he have us do? He didn't just address giving charity to someone, but addressing the causes that caused them to need that in the first place. And that's, that's our call as well. There's an old legend, and I'll close with this, of a village built on a river, a small village. Everybody in the village very kind, known for their kindness, a uh, close-knit community. And some children were playing by the river one day, and they saw something in the water, and they didn't know what it was, and they realized it's, it's, it's a baby. There, there were babies in the water floating down the river. The children ran and got the adults, and they came to the river, and they formed a chain, and they started pulling these children out of the river, but they just kept coming. More and more babies coming down the river, and they formed this chain, and, and then another chain, and they're working hard to, to, to save these children, and some of the villagers who were not able to be a part of the chain, they were older and, and not as capable, and so they, they moved away from the river, but they didn't go back to their homes. They went up the river to see who's throwing the babies in the river to stop them from throwing the babies in the river. And that old legend is to illustrate that what we are called to do as people of faith is to find out what's causing the hurt, the heartache, the pain, and to do what we can to address it. There's that question. What would Jesus cleanse today? Amen. Oh God, we come to you this morning not just seeking answers, but seeking strength and courage for the days ahead. We pray for courage to be the people who you have called us to be, people who seek justice and peace through your love for all, for all of your people to find that. We struggle with questions that seem to have no answers and problems that have overwhelming solutions. Surely we humans must test your patience, but we know that your love is all-encompassing, never-ending, always forgiving, and we thank you for loving us unconditionally. For we know there are lots of tables that need overturning in our lives. Beneath the veneer of respectability, the tidy rows and neat regulations, we struggle with our imperfections, our shortcomings, and we invite you into those dark places, and we pray for your forgiveness and guidance. Give us courage to speak out about our faith and teach those around us about your love for all people and to lead by example, showing and speaking with respect to others. All these things we ask in the name of the Prince of Peace, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thy is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. As we come to the close of our worship service, we are just so thankful to have people in the sanctuary. Even though you all have masks on, it is a thrill to see you here. But I'm also just as grateful for those that are online and we give thanks for everyone that's here worshiping today. I ask us now as we come to the close of our worship to think that worship is one thing we do. We'd like to, us to challenge ourselves to do worship plus one whatever that one might be, to serve someone else, to give, to come to Bible study. I invite you to the Wednesday night Bible study. It's in person and online. There's just lots of opportunities for us to work into our faith. So I invite us now to stand. If you're in the sanctuary, we get to hum, and it is going to be here I am, Lord. And if you're at home, just stand up and sing with your whole heart. Our gathering will soon be ended. Where will we go and what will we do? May grace, peace, hope, love, and joy forever accompany you. Amen. Please be seated for the postlude. <laughs>